Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, online event, which is being organised by UCL's Faculty of Laws, and it's on Hong Kong Club. Uh, my name is uh, Graham Penn. I'm uh, delighted to say that I'm going to be uh, chairing the session today. Uh, just very briefly, uh, as, as most of you will know, I'm a partner with Sydney Austin, uh, one of the uh, largest law firms in the world, uh, where I uh, practice in structured finance, uh, working with offshore vehicles myself quite often. In fact, I've been doing that over the past 30 years, so I'm looking forward to this uh, talk uh, as much as you are, I'm sure. Uh, I also teach at UCL and have done for many years, uh, and I'm delighted to say that there's a connection between me and Peter, uh, since Peter, after graduating at, at UCL, uh, spent uh, a period of his professional life, the start of his professional life actually, at Sidley in the London office is here, which is where I'm based. So it's great to see you, Peter, although you're at the other side of the world. Uh, just a brief introduction to Peter. Uh, you will have seen the details. Peter currently leads uh, Loeb Smith's banking, finance and corporate groups in Hong Kong, uh, where he is recognized as one of the leading uh, lawyers in relation to offshore vehicles, the use of offshore vehicles in relation to corporate finance and restructuring matters. Uh, very much a topical area at the moment, particularly after the uh, publication and uh, coverage of all the Pandora related matters, which I'm sure Peter is going to be focusing on. Uh, anyway, welcome to you all and, and thank you, Peter, for agreeing to uh, to take this session today and to tell us all about offshore vehicles. Just so thank you very much, Peter, and uh, away you go. Thank you very much, um, Graham. And of course, thanks also to the UCL Hong Kong Club. Um, and UCL Laws for organizing this webinar. And good morning, um, and a very warm welcome to all of you dialing in from Europe. And good afternoon, um, or good evening, of course, to those of you joining us from Asia. Um, and thanks for attending this webinar on offshore vehicles, um, and specifically certain truths um, and fallacies in relation to them. Okay, um, so what I would like to do today um, is to share my extensive experience, as Graham said, of practicing offshore law to give you a better flavor of exactly what offshore vehicles are um, and specifically how they're used by some of our clients to achieve their business objectives. And in the context of that, um, I'm going to shed some light on some of the largest offshore scandals of all time, um, such as the Pandora Papers that Graham has already referred to, um, but also the Panama Papers, to clarify exactly what they are, and then also explain how leaks of that nature have transformed, in my view anyway, the offshore legal industry as a whole. Um, and this is exactly, again, as Graham said, obviously a very topical matter right now, um, due to the fact that the Pandora Papers were released as recently as the end of last year. Now, in terms of how I'm going to structure this webinar, I'm going to start by briefly explaining what offshore vehicles are. I'm conscious that we have a wide audience on this webinar. I'm then going to talk you through the two largest offshore scandals of all time, namely the Pandora Papers and the Panama Papers. And then I'm going to turn my attention, as I said, to how those scandals have transformed the offshore legal industry. And as part of that discussion, I'm going to focus on the calls for more regulation and enforcement, also the trend towards greater transparency and how the international community has cracked down on what is arguably illicit tax evasion through the so-called economic substance regime. And I'm then going to look at some of the advantages of offshore vehicles and why people might use them and we'll conclude the webinar by examining the role of an offshore corporate law firm to give you a better flavor of the types of matters that we advise on. So let's start very briefly um, by the most obvious question first, um, what is an offshore vehicle? So I've set out a proposed definition of this term on the slide. Um, essentially, when we talk about offshore vehicles, we're talking about a vehicle which may or may not be a company. Um, that is essentially a business entity established outside of its primary location of operation. And so usually this will be in an internationally recognized offshore financial center, 
such as the British Virgin Islands, commonly referred to as the BVI, and the Cayman Islands, which of course are the jurisdictions um, that my firm advises on. And just by way of very brief introduction to these jurisdictions, um, the Cayman Islands is an autonomous British overseas territory in the Western Caribbean Sea. It's slightly west of Jamaica, and its primary industries include tourism, shipping, and of course, financial services. And for a very long time, it has been considered a major offshore financial center for businesses and individuals alive. We then have the BVI, which is also an autonomous British overseas territory, again in the Western Caribbean Sea, slightly east of Puerto Rico. And the financial services sector accounts for a majority of the BVI's income. So what do offshore jurisdictions such as the BVI and the Cayman Islands have in common? Um, well, for one thing, they are usually beautiful places with a very comfortable lifestyle revolving around outdoor activities and water sports. Um, but I think more importantly, for the purposes of this webinar, um, most reputable offshore financial centers are also politically stable. They have um, a sophisticated and reliable legal system. So the legal system in the BVI in the Cayman Islands is based on English common law. They also have highly sophisticated and reliable courts. Um, so with respect to the BVI and the Cayman Islands, there is a final right of appeal to the UK Privy Council for most cases. Um, and there's also an excellent professional infrastructure comprising lawyers, auditors, accountants, and all the other types of advisors that you may need for a commercial transaction. But unfortunately, and I hate to say this, another thing that offshore centers have in common is that their reputation has been tarnished by certain unfortunate incidents in the past. So I'd now like to turn my attention to some of those offshore scandals, um, starting with the Pandora Papers, which is the most recent offshore leak. Um, and just by way of background, um, the Pandora Papers comprises a leak of almost 12 million documents, um, or for those of you who like numbers um, and data, 2.94 terabytes of data that was released towards the end of last year by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the ICIJ. More than 600 journalists in 117 countries from over 140 media organizations trawled through the files from what is understood to be 14 different offshore service providers. Um, and this investigation exposed information in relation to residents from more than 200 countries and also territories. Um, and for those of you who are interested in media, um, I can share that the BBC Panorama and The Guardian led the investigation in the UK. Now, according to the ICIJ's um, website, uh, the individuals who are implicated include people who use offshore vehicles to buy and also sell property, to hide assets away from tax and judicial authorities, and also to make investments in companies and banking portfolios. And it has been alleged by the ICIJ that the files shed light on the financial dealings of fraudsters, drug dealers, fugitive cult leaders, although I confess I'm not even entirely sure what that is, um, and also corrupt sports officials. Now, interestingly, the ICIJ maintains a website on which details of all the individuals who are implicated in the Pandora leaks are disclosed. So you can actually go there and check whether your favorite sports star or your politician has made the list. And on that list, you will find over 330 politicians, 130 billionaires, as well as lots of celebrities and royals. And for the purposes of this webinar, I thought that some of you might be interested to know that the list includes two former chief executives of Hong Kong, namely Si Wai Lung and Tung Chi Hua. Now, the publication of the papers obviously triggered a fallout around the world. So within a couple of hours of publication um, in October of last year, the authorities in a number of countries, Spain, 
Australia, Panama, Brazil, etc., um, promised to open inquiries into different offshore holdings. Global watchdog groups also called for political action as well. And parliaments, including the European Parliament um, and those elsewhere, Malaysia, Brazil, etc., held debates about the findings of the Pandora Papers. And even US lawmakers actually proposed legislation to crack down on so-called financial enablers um, that I think anyway is the most significant reform of anti-money laundering rules since 9-11. Now, in terms of what is next, I do not believe that this is the end of the Pandora Papers. Um, and that is because the data um, in earlier offshore leaks, such as the Panama Papers, has historically been released gradually rather than all at once you know, the media being media. So I would say stay tuned because I'm fairly certain that there is more to come later on this year. So turning to the Panama Papers now, um, this comprises 2.6 terabytes of data or 11.5 million leaked documents. Again, similar to the Pandora Papers, mostly comprising emails, but also including things like contracts and passports that detail financial and attorney client information for more than 214,000 offshore entities leaked beginning in 2016. And as far as I know, it's the second biggest leak in history after the Pandora Papers, dwarfing even the data released by the WikiLeaks organization in 2010. And just to put this into context, if the amount of data released by WikiLeaks um, is equivalent to the population size of San Francisco, then the amount of data released in the Panama Papers is equivalent to that of India. And the documents date back to the 1970s in some cases, and they were created by and taken from um, former Panama law firm and corporate service provider, Masak Vinseca, which of course is the entity that was referenced in the short video clip that I shared with you at the beginning of the webinar. Now, just very briefly, um, I do also think that it is fascinating how this information came to light. Um, so I'm going to share some brief background information with you. The whistleblower leaked the, doc the documents um, to German journalists, to a German journalist from the newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung remains anonymous to my knowledge um, even to the journalists who worked on the investigation. And this is because he claimed that his life was in danger. And in a statement in May 2016, he cited income inequality as the reason for the actions that he took. Um, and he said that he leaked the documents simply because he understood or claimed to understand enough about their contents to, um, to, to, to realize the scale of the injustices that they described. Now, if you are wondering how the ICIJ got involved when the data had initially been leaked to a German newspaper, I mean, it was actually the German newspaper that asked the ICIJ for help um, because of the amount of data involved. And then journalists from 107 media organizations in 80 countries then analyzed the documents detailing the operations of Masak and Saka and published the initial stories in 2016. In case you're wondering how this played out for the founding partners of Masat Finseca, well, arguably not very well, because in October 2020, German authorities issued an international arrest warrant for the two founders um, on charges of accessory to tax evasion and forming a criminal organization. But to my knowledge, anyway, they have not yet been arrested. Just by way of further color on the Panama Papers, because I think it is important to know this, um, there are links to 12 existing or previous heads of state and government in the data, including dictators accused of looting their own countries. More than 60 relatives and associates of heads of state and other politicians are also implicated. And the files also reveal a suspected billion dollar money laundering ring involving close associates of Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. The leak also revealed that more than 500 banks, um, including some of their subsidiaries and branches, 
registered almost 15,600 shell companies with Masat Fonseca. And the data shows that these banks are principally registered in countries and territories with a high level of banking confidentiality, such as Switzerland, Luxembourg, Monaco, and also the Channel Islands of both Guernsey and Jersey. So importantly, what exactly does all of this mean and why on earth you might be thinking, am I sharing this with you in the first place um, as a partner at an international offshore law firm? Well, I cannot possibly sit to you and deny that there has been wrongdoing. There very clearly has been some wrongdoing. Um, but equally, it's really important to understand that most offshore structures, and certainly the ones that we advise on as a firm, are perfectly legitimate, and there are very good reasons for using them. And so it is really important to look um, beyond the sensationalization of this type of news um, that often comes from the media. And the ICIJ, um, which of course is behind all of these publications, acknowledges this very reality um, as per the quote, which I've set out on the slide. So that says there are legitimate uses for offshore companies and trusts. We do not intend to suggest or imply that any people, companies, or other entities included in the ICIJ database have broken the law or otherwise acted improperly. So it is important to think critically about the leaks and be conscious of the fact that simply being implicated in either the Pandora Papers or the Panama Papers does not actually of itself evidence any illegality whatsoever. So like I said at the outset, um, the wrongdoing that has emerged, has emerged has had a clear impact on the offshore legal industry. Um, and I just want to elaborate um, on some of the changes a little bit further, starting with the changes that have occurred with respect to anti-money laundering um, and know your customer type checks. And I'm going to be focusing on the high level trends here. So like I say, one consequence of these offshore scandals is that there is much more regulation now than ever before. And in particular, um, to avoid some of the scandals of the past, there's now considerable focus on knowing and verifying clients so that offshore vehicles are not used as a conduit for criminals and money launderers. And so in practice, this means that offshore law firms need to collect know your customer type documentation with respect to all clients that are not regulated or listed um, or subject to a couple of other exceptions by collating information and documents in relation to their ID um, their address and also their source of wealth. And firms such as ours also have to establish whether clients are politically exposed and conduct searches to verify that the client does not have a criminal history. Um, and for high risk clients, such as those involved in digital assets transactions of which we're now seeing a lot more, um, additional documentation may also be necessary such as reference letters, evidence of source of wealth, and even CVs. So the process has actually become really similar to that banks need to go through when onboarding new clients and opening new accounts. And the AML and the KYC that offshore jurisdictions such as the BVI and the Caymans have now developed um, are internationally recognized as robust and, and arguably even more stringent than similar checks conducted in jurisdictions such as the UK and Hong Kong. Now, regulation without enforcement of breaches is of course meaningless. Um, and last year there was a notable crackdown by authorities on professional service providers in the Cayman Islands. And this is because the Cayman was gray listed by the Financial Action Task Force last year, um, because it was recognized that there needs to be more robust enforcement of non-compliance. And the FATF is a, uh, for those of you who don't know, a governmental organization founded um, on the initiative of the G7, 
to develop practices to combat money laundering. And to exemplify the crackdown, um, a major offshore corporate service provider and a major offshore law firm were fined about 5 million and 10 million US dollars respectively for failing to meet their AML obligations. Um, and the law firm actually ended up requesting judicial review of the fine and incurred significant damage to its reputation. Now, thankfully, we haven't been fined as a firm for non-compliance, but I think this does show that regulations are now being taken very seriously and that there will be significant consequences if offshore providers do not uphold the high standards that are expected of them. The other trend in terms of more regulation and enforcement um, is that an increasing number of activities that have traditionally been unregulated are now moving into the regulated space. So for example, historically speaking, closed-ended funds, so-called closed-ended funds, um, have fallen outside the scope of regulation in the Cayman Islands. Um, but the Private Funds Act that was enacted in 2020 changed that. Um, so such funds now have to register with the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority. Um, they also now have to be audited, conduct valuations, appoint a money laundering reporting officer and fulfill many other requirements. And this has made fund compliance much more expensive in the Cayman Islands, but I personally think that it's also safeguarded the reputation of the jurisdiction and afforded valuable protection to investors. One other major change which has occurred, I think in part at least due to the offshore scandals, is a trend towards more transparency around offshore vehicles. And I think this is probably because some people and organizations, uh, including the ICIJ, take the view that if offshore vehicles are being used legitimately and there is nothing to hide, then there should be no element of secrecy surrounding them. And so for that reason, many offshore jurisdictions, including the BVI and the Cayman Islands, have implemented registers that certain entities need to maintain, which contain beneficial ownership information regarding the ultimate beneficial owners of offshore vehicles. Now, these are at the moment not accessible by the public, um, but they are accessible by relevant authorities. And there are significant penalties for failing to comply with regime and also criminal penalties for providing false information. And to sort of expand on that, something which is very hotly debated in the offshore legal market right now is whether beneficial ownership registers should be made accessible to the public. And there is at the moment a lot of talk about these types of registers becoming publicly available um, in the BVI and also the Cayman Islands in 2023, for example. Um, but personally, I'm not convinced that this is a development which is going to materialize, certainly not by 2023. Um, I think making beneficial ownership registers public sits very uncomfortably with the doctrine of privacy, which is embedded in common law. And I'm also not convinced that disclosing information that is already available to the authorities, to the public, is a good idea on balance, because you can only imagine that there would be people who seek to take advantage of that information for illicit purposes. Now, another perception of offshore vehicles, which is widely held, is that they are used to evade tax and for no other purpose. This is, of course, untrue, um, but offshore jurisdictions have implemented legislation in co-op and the OECD to tackle unlawful tax evasion. And the legislation is called the Economic Substance Regulations, and it has been passed in both the BVI and the Cayman Islands. And broadly speaking, um, the economic substance regime is designed to combat the shifting of profits by entities to offshore jurisdictions in which there are no or low taxes and in which the entity has no operations and no substantial operations. And that regime is now over two years old. And what it does is specifies that certain types of offshore vehicles conducting certain types of activities 
need to generate income in the relevant offshore jurisdiction and also need to have physical premises, expenditure, and personnel with appropriate qualifications in that jurisdiction in order to avail the benefits of being tax resident there. So in other words, entities can no longer just run their businesses through offshore structures solely for the purposes of evading tax. So that's the um, transformation which I think has occurred in the offshore legal industry over the last couple of years. <clears throat> I'm now going to move on to addressing some of the real and legitimate benefits um, of using offshore structures. And I've set out um, an overview of the types of benefits that I will be discussing on this slide. So first of all, um, cost and time effective. So everyone likes cheap and cheerful um, and offshore vehicles generally fit the bill. And um, just to give you a couple of examples of that, Assuming um, that all the KYC has been completed, which I've already talked about, both BVI and Cayman companies can usually be set up overnight using an express service or otherwise in just a matter of days. Um, and the cost of incorporating a Cayman company is usually less than one and a half thousand US dollars plus disbursements and BVI companies are even cheaper than that. Again, in terms of annual um, fees, Cayman companies less than 2,000 US dollars, BVI companies even less than that. Um, and for straightforward companies, the key annual maintenance requirements are limited to payment of an annual government fee and the filing of a simple annual return. Now, the regulation is also light touch um, in the sense that it's usually not necessary to involve the courts um, of the BVO or the Cayman Islands and also government bodies in commercial transactions. And similar to the UK and Hong Kong, um, it's the board of directors that is responsible for the day to day management of a company and most approvals will just need to come from them. The shareholders may also need to approve certain matters such as changes to constitutional documents, liquidation, share buybacks, um, but that is not actually needed in relation to most matters if a company's constitutional documents are in relatively standard form. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, both jurisdictions are very much reliant upon and driven by financial services. So there are a lot of very seasoned advisors who are well placed to quickly assist on a commercial transaction. And again, um, the legal system is based on UK common law, um, which is well developed. And we also have a reliable and well tested judicial system in place that is extremely experienced in dealing with high value and complex commercial disputes. Now, one of the many reasons that both BVI and Cayman companies are so popular um, is that the corporate governance regime is extremely flexible. Um, so it can be as simple or as complicated as you like. Um, and this is why, you know, we have a range of clients all the way from startups to listed companies and large banks um, that use um, these jurisdictions in their commercial transactions. Um, so just to put this into context in terms of how simple things can actually be. Um, so companies can have a sole director and a sole shareholder. In fact, for simple companies, they can be and often are the same person and corporate directors and corporate shareholders are also permitted um, and fairly common. Um, there are also no residency requirements for the directors, unlike in many other jurisdictions. So theoretically speaking, all of the directors could be uh, outside the BVI and outside the Cayman Islands. There are also no rules regarding the frequency and location of meetings for most companies subject to the memorandum and articles of association. Um, and the frequency and location of meetings will quite simply be dictated by the activities of the company and the transactions that are being undertaken. There's no requirement for a company secretary to appointed um, in contrast with other jurisdictions, for example, Hong Kong, 
Um, but that being said, BVI and Cayman companies still need to have a uh, BVI or Cayman based registered office provider, but they usually take a very minimalist role in practice. You also have no exchange control restrictions. Um, all regulations as a matter of BVI or Cayman law. In other words, there are no government imposed limitations on the purchase or sale of um, currencies or indeed the transfers of any currency across borders. So that's in sharp contrast um, to jurisdictions such as China. Financial statements, um, those are not typically required to be prepared by the BVR or the Cayman company, um, unless they are listed or regulated, of course. And even to the extent um, that financial statements are prepared, they do not usually have to be audited. And then lastly, um, although there are certain record keeping requirements, they are generally quite straightforward. So you have to keep copies of your constitutional documents. Um, other documents which have been filed by the company should be properly kept, along with minutes, resolutions. Um, the companies have to have a certain level of documentation to show and explain a company's transactions and to enable the financial position of the company to be determined with reasonable accuracy. Um, but that's it. And there are generally no further requirements. Now, one of the reasons offshore vehicles continue to be popular is that they mitigate risk and also facilitate transactions. Um, so just a couple of examples of that, which I've set out um, on the slide. Firstly, um, offshore companies have what is known as separate corporate personality and limited liability. Um, this will probably be familiar to most of you because they are concepts developed under UK common law. Um, but briefly, separate corporate personality means that the entity is distinct from its shareholders and directors. In other words, it has a separate existence. And this means that offshore companies can, and of course frequently do, enter into contracts and agreements themselves, and the company itself enjoys the benefit of those agreements and is also liable for the obligations under them. And importantly, the investors or the shareholders are not liable under those agreements. The liability of the shareholders is limited to any amounts unpaid on the shares, so they can happily invest in the company with the knowledge that they will not be hit with a massive liability if something goes wrong. And of course, that encourages investments and entrepreneurism. Secondly, uh, offshore jurisdictions such as the BVR and the Cayman Islands offer strong protection to creditors um, in financing transactions. And this is one of the reasons why they are so popular as special purpose vehicles in that space. Um, let me provide a really simple example. So it's relatively common for BVI and Cayman companies to act um, as borrowers or guarantors or security providers in finance transactions. And most of the time, if you have a large loan being provided to a company, um, then the lender will want to take security, such as a mortgage or a charge, over the borrower's assets or over related company's assets. And if things go wrong and the loan is not repaid on time, then the lender can enforce its security. And unlike in other jurisdictions, it's relatively easy to enforce security that is governed by BVI and Cayman law. Um, and that is because there are many self-help remedies and it's often not necessary to go to court. And in addition to that, um, jurisdictions such as the BVI have an extremely well-developed security filing system in place, which protects the priority of security interests that have been granted in favor um, of a secured party. And that filing system is cheap um, and the system works very well in practice. Now, thirdly, um, I just want to highlight that certain offshore jurisdictions have historically been very popular for the purposes of listings and also for the purposes of forming funds. And I was actually looking at some interesting statistics ahead of this webinar, which I would like to share with you. So over 60% 
of oil companies as things stand at the moment listed on the main board of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange are actually incorporated in the Cayman Islands and around another 20% are incorporated in Bermuda, another offshore jurisdiction, and only about a total of 19% are incorporated in a combination of China and Hong Kong. And that might come um, as a surprise uh, to many of you, and, and you might be wondering um, why that is. But I think there are fundamentally two explanations for this. First of all, um, as I've tried to touch upon, Cayman law is extremely flexible and jurisdiction is also tax neutral, um, as I will explain soon. And second of all, um, the Cayman Islands has always been a highly popular jurisdiction of choice for listings. So it is tried and tested and service providers and regulators are highly familiar with how Cayman entities work in practice. And as the saying goes, if it ain't broken, then don't fix it. With respect to fund formation, the Cayman Islands, I think for similar reasons, remains as one of the most popular jurisdictions of choice, um, both for structuring private equity funds and also hedge funds. The fourth example um, I want to give will be very relevant to those of you working in private practice in Asia. Um, and this is because offshore entities do facilitate inbound investments into countries such as China. And this is predominantly because Chinese law prohibits foreign investments to be made into Chinese companies in certain restricted sectors. And the solution which has been devised is that foreign investors of that nature invest into offshore companies, such as BVI and Cayman companies, which then through other structures um, and a combination of contracts, enter into a relationship with relevant operating Chinese company. Now you might think that this uh, sounds illegal or convoluted because it circumvents the law, um, but it's actually a very common structure which has been around for over two decades. And the Chinese authorities are, of course, um, perfectly aware of it. And this is an example on the slide um, of a so-called variable interest structure, um, which facilitates inbound Chinese investments. So you can see from the slide that the foreign investors or the overseas investors um, hold a controlling interest in a so-called wholly foreign owned entity or the WFOE. And as you can see, there is no shareholding relationship between the WFOE entity um, and the target company, the operating Chinese company. Rather the structure is based on certain controlling and benefits transfer contracts, the VIE contracts with the target company and its shareholders. Now, I suppose a presentation on offshore companies wouldn't be complete with a short section dedicated to taxation. And the point I want to make clear is that using offshore vehicles is not intended to facilitate tax evasion. Rather, the key takeaway point is that offshore entities are tax neutral. And this simply means that additional taxes are not levied by virtue of using them. <clears throat> So for example, the BVI and Cayman Islands do not directly impose taxes such as income tax or corporation tax, um, and they don't have any withholding tax either. And subject to a couple of exceptions that do not usually apply, um, they will not impose things like stamp duty um, on share transfers. And this is exactly why many investment funds are structured offshore, um, because they do not get hit with taxes when they pay a distribution to the investors. Now, of course, whether the ultimate recipient of the distribution needs to pay tax is a completely separate matter. And that will depend on the investor's own jurisdiction of tax residence. So in the very simple example on the slide, whether the UK investor pays tax will ultimately be a question of UK tax law. Now, as you would expect from a jurisdiction that is so focused on large corporate and banking transactions, service providers are banned by confidentiality. 
and are generally not permitted to disclose any details regarding a transaction to third parties. Most of the information regarding a BVO or Cayman Islands company is confidential, but it is possible for certain service providers, such as a law firm like ourselves, um, to obtain limited information about a company. So for example, in the Cayman Islands, it is possible to get a list of the names of the existing directors of that company. And in the BVI, it is possible to get copies of certain constitutional documents and also um, filings pertaining to the registration of charges as examples. But I think on balance, you know, it's, it's undeniable that um, both BVI and Cayman corporate law are very much skewed towards confidentiality, although that might be changing as I've discussed earlier on in the webinar. And so just to wrap this section of the webinar up, um, I wanted to highlight how some of these points may be implemented in practice. I know this is a very messy and busy slide, um, but I think it is useful in exemplifying a couple of the points. So for example, um, MPF payments, the mandatory provident fund payments or the pension payments um, in Hong Kong are um, often structured through offshore funds due to their tax neutrality. You also have on the slide references to trusts and high net worth individuals who often use offshore vehicles um, to hold different types of assets due to the vehicle's limited, uh, due to the vehicle's separate corporate personality um, and the limited liability that they are afforded as shareholders. And then you have reference to um, BVI, SPVs, for example, which are often used to hold single assets such as real estate, shares in other companies, ships, aircraft, etc., cetera, um, because they're relatively cheap to maintain and offer a good level of confidentiality. So last of all, um, I just want to provide a flavor of the types of work that we actually do um, and what we advise on as an offshore corporate law firm. Um, because even some of our clients don't actually have a very good idea of this. Um, and I've set out on the slide some of the uh, key areas of focus for an offshore corporate law firm. And this is not exhaustive by any means. Um, and of course, there are many other types of um, offshore law firms that focus on other types of law. So for example, wills, probate, trusts, conveyancing, etc. But the practice areas set out on the slide exemplify the typical practices of an offshore corporate law firm. So you first have banking and finance, um, which would normally involve advising a lender or a borrower on a corporate loan which has been provided. And the purpose of that loan could be anything. It could be to make an acquisition, to provide liquidity for general corporate purposes or indeed anything else. And most of the corporate loans, um, certainly the ones that we advise on, are usually secured. And in that case, our role would be to review and draft finance documents and other security documents being entered into by the BVI and the Cayman companies to make sure that the directors of the offshore vehicles have properly authorized the transaction and to issue a so-called legal opinion on the effectiveness and the validity um, of documents. And one of the most interesting finance transactions that I've worked on um, was an acquisition financing led by Bain Capital um, of Transmall Divian Airways, which is, as some of you may know, the luxury seaplane operator um, that takes everyone to their high-end resorts in the Maldives. Um, and this is very memorable um, because I couldn't make it to the closing reception in the Maldives, which was extremely disappointing, as you can imagine. You then have um, corporate, um, again, a really interesting area that can involve advising on mergers and acquisitions, investments, joint ventures, listings, so IPOs and delistings, or in other words, take private transactions. And um, part of our role is often to conduct due diligence on an offshore vehicle which means that we need to find out as much information about it as possible and report back to the client. We then have investment funds, 
um, which involves forming and launching funds such as private equity funds, real estate funds, hedge funds, and also, of course, cryptocurrency funds, which are growing in popularity. Regulatory, um, this is an area which has been of growing importance to the offshore legal sector as a whole. Um, and nowadays, we often find ourselves advising on things like economic substance, which I've already mentioned, um, in relation to entities that are regulated under the different pieces of funds legislation under the Cayman Islands rules, for example, so the Private Funds Act, um, and also, of course, in relation to different anti-money laundering obligations, the beneficial ownership regulations, and so on and so forth. And in as a transactional lawyer, um, we don't usually get involved in this because most of our transactions don't have regulatory um, elements attached to them. Um, but one of the most interesting deals that I worked on was um, an acquisition of a major corporate service provider by Permira, um, a large private equity fund, which required the consent and approval of the BVI Financial Services Commission. And that was because the underlying business that was acquired in that transaction was a regulated entity. You then have restructuring. Um, you can imagine that we have been quite busy in this space um, as a result of COVID and as a result of the liquidity problems that many companies have seen. Um, and large corporate groups often include BVI and Cayman entities, um, which is why we are often involved in this space. Um, and then finally, you have secretarial and fiduciary. Uh, which is essentially about the setup and incorporation of offshore vehicles and the ongoing maintenance of them. Um, and of course, clients regularly approach us to set up their vehicles uh, to make sure that we can not only incorporate them, but then also make sure that the companies meet their ongoing legal obligations from the BVO and Cayman point of view. So thanks so much for listening. Um, I hope that this was interesting um, and that you have learned something about offshore vehicles. Um, if you have any questions, then please do ask them um, in the Q&A box now. Thank you, Peter. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. I'm sure everyone enjoyed that as much as I did. I, I really did. I've got a whole host of questions and if no one else is jumping in, I'm going to ask them. Uh, we did have a couple of questions before we started the uh, webinar. So if you'd like to pick those up first, and then we've got uh, some questions that are coming in the Q&A, which I will pick up and uh, post to you after you've answered the first two. So thank you. Sounds good. Um, so the first question um, that was lodged um, ahead of the webinar is um, whether I think um, offshore jurisdictions, so specifically the BVI and the Cayman Islands, will retain their attractiveness in light of BEPS2 Pillar 2. And I think that's a great question. Um, and by way of introduction, you know, for, to, to those of you who are less familiar with these terms, um, the term BEPS uh, is a reference to base erosion and profit shifting, which essentially refers to tax planning strategies um, used by multinational enterprises um, that exploit gaps and mismatches in tax rules to avoid paying tax. And the BPS was put together by the OECD largely because it was recognized that developing countries' higher reliance on corporate income tax means that they suffer from base erosion and profit shifting disproportionately. Now, the first pillar of the BPS framework is actually what I've already addressed in the webinar, namely the economic substance regulations pursuant to which entities conducting certain types of activities that wish to take advantage of being tax resident in a jurisdiction with no or low taxes must have a presence there. Um, but the second pillar to which the question relates um, is designed to ensure that large multinational enterprises pay a minimum level of tax on the income coming from each jurisdiction where they operate. Now, this is very new, um, but 
as I understand it, pursuant to the rules that are being proposed, taxpayers that either have no overseas presence or that have less than 750 million euros in consolidated revenues are not in scope. And similarly, entities that meet the definition of a pension, um, an investment or real estate fund will also be exempt. And the way that I understand regime will work is that taxpayers who are in scope of the rules will essentially calculate their effective rate of tax for each jurisdiction where they operate and then pay a so-called top-up tax for the difference between their effective tax rate per jurisdiction and the 15% minimum rate uh, that is proposed to be imposed on in-scope entities. And so to directly address the question, um, as to the impact that I think this will have on offshore vehicles, as well, it's still obviously very early days and relatively difficult to predict. Um, but on the whole, um, I'm not actually expecting to see a material impact, um, considering the revenue threshold that has to be satisfied in order to be in scope, um, and also in light of the exemptions for funds, um, and also considering that the economic substance rules under pillar one, which I've already talked about, have been implemented. And so as to the impact specifically in the types um, of law that we advise on and the BVI and Cayman Islands, given the uh, fund heavy nature of the Cayman Islands and all the exemptions for funds, and given the nature of the BVI um, as a largely sort of um, holding company type jurisdictions for non m and &E type enterprises, on the whole, um, I'm not, I don't think that this is going to have as big an impact as some people might think. Let me uh, just move to the next question that was asked ahead of the webinar. So the next question was, um, what, is, what is the biggest advantage of a Cayman fund uh, compared against um, the LPF in Hong Kong? So again, just by way of background for those of you who may be less familiar with funds, the Hong Kong LPF, um, well, it's a reference to the limited partnership fund in Hong Kong. Um, introduced towards, I think, the end of 2020. And it was very much put together to target private equity and venture capital funds. And the idea was to offer a competitive alternative to funds being established in other leading jurisdictions, such as the Cayman Islands. Now, many of the features of the LPF are really similar um, to that of Cayman funds. Uh, that are formed as limited partnerships. So for example, they do not have separate legal personality, which means they act for a general partner. Um, the GP must appoint responsible person to implement AML policies, to ensure proper custody of assets, to appoint an auditor, etc. cetera. Um, but there are also some differences. So the Hong Kong LPF, must only have, as I understand it, one general partner, whereas a Cayman fund may have several general partners. Um, Hong Kong profits tax has to be considered in respect of an LPF's financial returns, whereas of course the Cayman position is simple because it's completely tax neutral. Um, I suppose those are advantages that speak in favor of the Hong Kong LPF. But then again, on the other hand, Hong Kong LPFs are quite a bit cheaper to set up than a limited partnership in the Cayman Islands. Now, when the regime was introduced, there were quite a lot of questions in terms of how the Cayman Islands would be impacted by Hong Kong LPFs. Um, and what we have seen over the last one and a half or so years since the regime was implemented um, is firstly that certain Chinese or PRC investors, in particular state-owned enterprises, are more willing to invest in an LPF for policy reasons, um, given the, the, the link between Hong Kong and China, and 
And of course, conversely, I suppose investors from other jurisdictions, maybe the US, are more skeptical. And second of all, we have also seen a lot of local investment managers in Hong Kong who are more conscientious um, on costs that are more willing to use LPFs to establish investment funds. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, and we still do get inquiries from time to time on the redomiciliation of funds from Cayman to Hong Kong. Um, so, you know, that's a trend that I expect to continue going forward as well. Okay. Thanks, Peter. If I can pick up some of the questions, some of the points that are being raised uh, are overlapping. So I'll try and cover them in the same question. So uh, one goes to a point that I was hoping to raise with you, the, the substance that you talked about, which was quite interesting, the economic and physical substance rules that are changing. And one question is, is it, do you think, in your opinion, that is likely to make offshore centers less attractive? Because we know that historically that has been an enormous attraction. And a part of the question that is raised by someone else, does that mean that corporate service providers that have sort of dominated uh, those vehicles are likely to have a less important role to play in the future? I know that's two questions, but they are connected. <laughs> no, great questions. Um, and. You know, I think on the whole, again, offshore jurisdictions such as the BVI and the Cayman Islands, um, we, we do not think that they will vanish in, and grow into insignificance as a result of those economic substance rules. Um, because you have to remember that the economic substance rules are largely based on the BEPS framework. And the purpose of that framework is to eliminate the shifting of profits um, by entities to the BVI and the Cayman Islands if they have no substantive activities there. But if you consider the nature of what a lot of BVI and Cayman companies are doing, well, they are holding companies. A lot of these companies are holding companies. So there is no element of profit shifting in the first place. And actually, um, you know, if you're familiar with the economic substance rules, then you will be aware of the fact that the requirements to comply that are imposed on holding companies are significantly reduced. So for companies that are just genuinely holding companies and do nothing other than hold equity in other companies, all they have to do is satisfy a so-called reduced economic substance test, um, which is in summary satisfied if that entity complies with all its filings, pays all its filing fees um, on time and engages a registered office provider in either the BVI or the Cayman Islands, which by the way, all entities have to do anyway. Um, and of course, the other side to this is investment funds. Um, again, there are a lot of exceptions um, for investment funds. Uh, the types of activities that are more problematic um, are things like if you have a BVO or a Cayman company um, that owns intellectual property that is generating income, that is hugely problematic and you should seek legal advice because the penalties for that are potentially massive. Um, and that is because it's been widely recognized um, that there can and probably is an element of profit shifting involved uh, for companies performing that activity. Similarly, if you have companies involved in certain types of um, shipping business or headquarters business, or, or basically um, offshore vehicles that are being used as an operational entity, those are the most problematic, but not investment funds and not holding companies. The second type, the, the second part of the question relating to corporate service providers, um, and I think my response to that follows from what I've just said. Um, no, I, I think that they will continue to remain hugely important. Um, all BVI and Cayman companies, as I've just said, must maintain a registered office provider um, in the BVI or the Cayman Islands. You know, BVI and Cayman companies involved in commercial transactions must engage legal advisors um, because banks will want legal opinions, regulators might want memorandums, investors will want due diligence reports, and I don't think any of that is going to go away anytime soon.
Can I just, do you mind if I just press you a little bit on that? Because what we're seeing in other offshore jurisdictions, Jersey and Guernsey are good examples, is that that is still the case, but the real substance issue that we're talking about here, it requires that to be a little bit more than just bluntly renter directors in the local jurisdiction. So people are having to fly into those jurisdictions to attend board meetings and physically be there. And, you know, bluntly, there's a world of difference flying from the UK to Jersey and Guernsey and flying to the BVI or the Cayman Islands. And so when we talk about substance, and this came out of the question, it's not just having people that are identified as, you know, people that are directors of the company, but people that have real substance in those roles. Forgive me for pressing you, but that is a difference, people, isn't it? Well, you know, maybe I didn't explain this well enough, but um, for those companies that are subject to the full scope of the economic substance regulations, and not only the reduced requirements that apply to holding companies, um, there are an extensive range of obligations that have to be complied with. So, for example, um, if you are um, a BVI company or a gaming company with an intellectual property business and you generate income from that business, the expectation would actually be um, that some of that income is generated in the BVI or the Caymans, that you have expenditure in the relevant jurisdiction, um, that you have physical premises in the relevant jurisdiction, and also importantly, that you have um, personnel um, conducting that activity in that jurisdiction and not just any personnel, um, but personnel with appropriate qualifications um, to conduct that activity from the BVO or the Cayman Islands. And um, we haven't yet seen how enforcement is going to play out, um, but the fines for non-compliance serve um, as a huge deterrent because you know, in the BVI, for example, if you're a non-compliant um, IP business, if you're a high risk, what's defined as a high risk IP business, then the fines for compliance can run into hundreds of thousands of US dollars, um, and you can potentially also be struck off as a company. Okay, interesting. Uh, shift altogether with tax. Uh, it's an interesting question on tax harmonization. And as you know, this has been talked about, you know, daily almost at the OECD level. And, you know, the question is, do you expect that narrative to have an impact ultimately with offshore companies and, and lead to more of them, you know, coming back onshore for tax purposes? Do you have any sense of that, Peter? Difficult question, um, but I think in the context of all of this, we must not forget that, um, and, and again, as I try to explain throughout the webinar, um, that offshore vehicles offer a lot of advantages um, beyond you know, tax efficiencies. I mean, that's the reality of it. We have many clients, for example, US investors, who at the moment could not possibly fathom putting their money um, into a Hong Kong company. Um, they're just not comfortable with that for political reasons, cultural reasons, or otherwise. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, BVI and Cayman companies have been around for a long time. People know how they work. The regulators are comfortable with them. Most investors are comfortable with them. Um, they are used for listings. The stock exchanger are familiar with them. And so I do not think that all this talk about tax harmonization is going to lead to some sort of landslide shift in the overall approach um, that is being taken. Okay, interesting. A specific question now that I confess doesn't mean anything to me, but I'm sure it will to you in relation to Hong Kong. So do you perceive that there's going to be any shift away from the dominance of Cayman uh, BVI type structures with respect to funds that you know are introducing this limited partnership ordinance in Hong Kong SAR uh, in 2020? I mean, so as I've tried to explain already, I don't think there will be a massive shift. Um, we have actually seen some clients moving away, um, mostly from Cayman funds, because they are more expensive than um, Hong Kong funds. Um, and also, you know, we do have some Chinese clients um, that are ultimately more comfortable um, in investing their money through Hong Kong vehicles, 
rather than Cayman vehicles, especially because they are cheaper. So we have advised on a couple of redomiciliations, um, but equally for the sorts of reasons I've just mentioned, due to the political tensions between China um, and the US, equally we have a number of clients um, who I think we'd never look to do that. Um, so I think the Cayman Islands is here to stay um, as a premier you know, jurisdiction for funds, both private equity and hedge funds. But are we going to lose business to the new regime in Hong Kong? Absolutely. And we've already seen that happen. Interesting. That's very interesting. I wonder if I can throw a question to myself, because you were talking very interesting observations about security structures and, and how that works, uh, which is all fine. But of course, we all know that the real security is not going to be within the offshore company. The underlying business is somewhere else. And I know you're not suggesting otherwise, but the security invariably within the offshore structure is, is shares in the relevant company. And it's a question of then enforcing against the shareholding. So you can then take control of what is typically an intermediate company so that you can then go down in terms of the enforcement ladder. So, you know, for me, what is really key is the enforcement regime in relation to shares. And a two part question here. What is that and how efficient is that in, in Cayman and BBI, if you can just briefly touch upon that. And then increasingly what we're finding elsewhere, certainly in Europe and in North America, is that people are using uh, different types of enforcement techniques, what I would loose, loosely call you know, consensual enforcement techniques, where instead of going through a formal enforcement process, they're literally taking over control of the company and then looking to enforce once they've taken control. I, I assume we're seeing that in these offshore centers as well. And, and if you could comment on how that can be structured, that would be helpful. Absolutely. Well, so we are seeing, as you can imagine, more and more enforcement yeah. um, in the context of COVID and the liquidity issues are specifically for some of our Chinese clients. Um, there's been a real crunch in the real estate sector in particular there. Um, the, one of the reasons both the BVI and the Cayman Islands are so popular in um, the sort of secured lending spaces because, as I've said, um, the enforcement regime is straightforward and more often than not, and certainly if the security documents have been properly drafted, um, the secured party will have the right to enforce on the shares um, when the relevant um, enforcement trigger um, ha has been triggered without going to court. So in other words, remedies are self-help in nature. Now, what do I mean by self-help in nature? So if you have uh, a share mortgage over um, shares um, over, let's say, a BVI company, then typically as part of the deliverable package that is given um, upon execution of that document, the secured party will receive a signed but undated share transfer form along with any share certificates. Um, and so the idea being that, you know, when there is a default, the secured party or its nominee can simply date that document, um, present it to the registered agent, which maintains the register of members, um, and then ask that the register of members be updated to reflect the secured party or its nominee as the registered shareholder. And at that point, as a matter of BVI law, um, you have de facto control of the company. Now, to further touch on the flexibility, um, some secured parties may not want to be the registered shareholder because there could be you know, consolidation issues, tax, regulatory, et cetera. And so as part of the usual deliverable package, you also have um, an irrevocable um, proxy and power of attorney given, again, undated. So the idea being that if the secured party or its nominee wants to take control of the company without becoming the registered shareholder, then it can simply date that document and exercise all the powers that the shareholder of the relevant shares um, would otherwise have had. So, for these reasons, it's actually quite unusual, um, but it's certainly more usual than not to see self-help enforcement rather than going through the courts, because that obviously is a more outdrawn and much more expensive process in practice.
Interesting. Thank you for that very comprehensive response. Just a very specific question on VIE structures. I, I don't know if you can pick this up, but the question is with regard to VIE structures, has China now prohibited the future use of these? <laughs> I don't know is the honest answer. Um, there is a lot of um, ongoing dialogue with respect to VIE structures. Um, not only in China, but in the US. Uh, in the US, the, um, the, the SEC has basically recognized that many investors are not sufficiently informed um, about what VIE structures are and what they mean, and specifically the fact that many investors you know, do not understand or certainly are not put on sufficient notice of the fact that as an investor in a VIE structure, you do not um, indirectly, directly or even indirectly have shareholding control over the operating entity um, in the PRC. And so what the SEC has said is that going forward, you know, structures of that nature will um, need to have proper disclosures regarding them so that investors are not caught off guard. Now, China um, is also looking at VIE structures. Um, I think a lot of this has to do with the political tensions with the US. Um, but also what I think is driving a lot of this is this idea that a lot of companies that are listed um, in places like the US or NASDAQ or the NYSE, they very much want to bring them home. And so what I think we're going to see is an overall trend for um, Chinese regulators to make regulations which encourage companies of that nature um, to maybe come delist and then relist in either China or Hong Kong. Okay. Uh, look, Lisa, I appreciate we're, we're out of time, but I wonder if I can just extend it by two minutes. There's two or three questions. I don't know if you can pick this up uh, quickly, Peter, but that are focusing on the loss, bluntly, of tax revenues from local jurisdictions through these uh, tax uh, havens, as they're typically and often referred to, one focusing in particular on uh, Africa, uh, but I think that, that there is a general point. Uh, do you have a sense of the uh, income streams that are lost as a consequence of these offshore centres being set up and the extent to which those losses may be minimised uh, through some of the things that you've been talking about? You talked earlier about you know, the, 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 the transparency uh, changes that are taking place, people looking at the ultimate beneficial ownership of investors. Uh, which, you know, bluntly, when I was listening to you, Peter, went more to the professional services that are establishing who their clients are and who they're owned by. It didn't seem to me that you were suggesting that the tax authorities will be looking to share information that will then enable uh, tax authorities in jurisdictions where assets are situated to be able to then do something about that information. But anyway, that's a long question. Is there, Can you quickly try to just cover that? <laughs> Well, that is a complicated one, but actually um, the beneficial ownership registers do have to, in both BVI and the Cayman Islands, disclose who the beneficial, the ultimate beneficial owners are. Um, those are available to tax authorities in the BVI and the Cayman Islands, um, both of which have put in place um, information exchange uh, agreements with certain other jurisdictions, the UK, for example, that can then go and request the information um, that is uh, set out um, in law. I think to the broader question of, um, you know, what sort of income streams are lost, um, I don't know. I don't really have an answer to that. I'm safe to say that I think uh, you know, the economic substance rules are a good start because they now mean that entities cannot simply book their profits in the BVI and the Cayman Islands um, if they have absolutely no substance. And I also think that on the whole, the 15% um, global tax under pillar two of the BEPA framework will help tackle some of these problems. Yeah, step in the right direction. Okay, yeah. well, that was fascinating. We, we've gone past our time. So thank you, everyone. I apologize that we didn't manage to get quite all of the questions covered, but I think we, we did probably 90% of them. Uh, and on behalf of everyone, Peter, if I can thank you, that was fascinating. And so thank you, everyone, for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you hopefully another time. Thank you again, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you.